Um, I want to I want to pick up where we were at the end of the first half here. Um, we were sort of using this website. It's kind of built to be about differential diagnosis, and um, I set it up before we got onto this website. But this is about orthostatic hypertension, um, and we looked at and ruled out a number of things, so we can start to think about what's really going on here. Um, now, I certainly um, hinted at that the autonomic neuropathy is something we want to keep in mind. We could click through on this and look at what this has here. We're not going to, I mean, I obviously just did, but uh, I'm going to leave this page because um, this particular page actually is not um, very useful for what I want, where I want to go with this because it's, it's just too general of a description of autonomic neuropathy. So instead, what I want to do is take out the dizzy low blood pressure part of the original search we did and put in orthostatic hypertension. Okay. So it's still the same search. It's just we've established that um, the uh, dizziness and the blood pressure are really part of one thing, which is called orthostatic hypertension. But the sweat is not connected to those two things. So uh, if we do that search, what the heck? Oh, that's right. Never mind. Um, <clears throat> there's another search page, and I, I got confused. I, I was wondering why this the result I wanted wasn't there. but Because we're not to that search just yet. So um, there's a number, again, of um, patient information type websites. Uh, Medscape, which is the one I'm about to go to, but then some ones in here that are kind of particular. Rare Disease Network, um, which for those hypochondriacs that just aren't satisfied by Medscape. Um, uh, the dizzinessandbalance.com website. So, I don't know. But I do actually just want to go to this first one here, um, which is fairly helpful. Now, this is still to an extent presented in a sort of differential diagnosis way. Um, there are three syndromes that are described which fit with um, autonomic failures, which is uh, going to help explain those symptoms together, the orthostatic hypertension and the sweat, lack of sweating. Now, I'm actually going to go down quite a bit. Um, in uh, the pursuit of um, ruling out things, I'm going to start at the bottom of the list and work my way up. Now, the list on this page, which I didn't actually talk through there a second ago. Uh, actually, let me make these things a little uh, larger so everybody can read it. Um, so uh, now that it's larger, uh, I can just talk about this. So it has this, these three syndromes here. There's uh, idiopathic orthostatic hypertension and other forms of pure autonomic failure, and pure autonomic failure is PAF. Um, and then autono autoimmune autonomic neuropathy and multiple system atrophy, AAN and MSA. Um, there are these three here. What I want to do is I want to go down to the bottom and actually work from the bottom of the list up um, and uh, rule them out. But uh, before I go down there, since I am talking about this, can anybody tell me what idiopathic means? Sorry? Right. So pathic or pathos, which is the, the root here, um, means disease. And then idio, um, which is actually the root of the word idiot, um, and also the word, uh, it's in the word idiosyncratic, uh, which is basically just means weird. Um, <clears throat> you can kind of directly translate the, the word to mean weird disease, okay? Um, but really it's used more uh, formally to mean uh, we don't know what it is. If anybody ever tell, or we don't know what causes it. If anybody ever tells you that you have idiopathic whatever disease, what they're really telling you is you have this disease and we don't know why. Um, 
And usually it doesn't really matter why. The fact that you have the disease is important because they know how to treat it. They just don't know necessarily what the original cause was. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, we look at our patient and we know what, he, what symptoms he has and we can ascribe it to this, but that doesn't tell, him, tell us why he has uh, that particular thing. So idiopathic just, how did you put it? Uh, hard to call you Vicky again, Jackie. Uh, no yeah, no cause. That's a good way of thinking about it. We just don't know. Okay? Um, science has all sorts of wonderful ways of saying uh, how stupid we really are without sounding stupid. It's great. Um, anyway, so let me go to the bottom of this uh, list here. And actually, the bottom of the list is a fourth thing, which isn't even in that little bullet list I just showed you, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, and uh, one hallmark of this is that there's a greater than 30 uh, beat per minute increase in heart rate on standing. How can we rule that out? Sorry? What's low? Right, so it's not really low, but his heart rate isn't elevated. Yeah. Yeah. So he, has a, he has a normal resting heart rate, so he doesn't show this integral feature of this particular uh, syndrome, so it's not that. For whatever reason, they left that out of the list. But then we go up here, and we have multiple system atrophy, which is the third thing on the list. Um, <clears throat> And so it starts off, well, it starts off by saying that it manifests similarly to the other two diseases. And of course, we're working our way up from the bottom, so we haven't looked at what those diseases are. But essentially what we're doing is we're looking at what separates this disease from the others, and then we're going to look at AAN and see what it separates it from uh, PAF, and then we'll work our way up to PAF. Um, so it starts with pyramidal or cerebellar abnormalities. What does that mean? Any of those words look familiar to you? Well, there's yeah. Cerebellum. The cerebellum. yeah, so this, this is talking about something having to do with the cerebellum, which usually has to do with balance and motor functions like that. Uh, are there any other words there that you recognize? Yeah, Albernama. What does that mean? I can't say the word. What does it mean? <laughs> so that's what's wrong. So uh, you might not recognize pyramidal, but cerebellar abnormalities means problems with the cerebellum. Um, just the teacher in me wants to cover this. Uh, pyramidal uh, is describing the connections in your nervous system from your motor cortex to your spinal cord. So it's the system that tells you how to make uh, conscious movements of your skeletal system, skeletal muscles. Okay. Um, it's just another aspect of motor control. Really, the pyramidal and cerebellar systems work together to help you control how you consciously move. But uh, so, how can we rule that out? Based on his, uh, no yeah, it said very explicitly that he had no alert <laughs> neurological findings. So these would be neurological findings. So he doesn't have them, can't be that. If we just continued on through here, this is just describing other neurological things that have to do with it, which we don't have to rule out here because we've already ruled it out on that basis. Um, I do want to point out, because it'll be relevant in a little while, uh, this says Parkinsonian findings, which means like Parkinson's disease. And I'm mentioning that because a little later on, Parkinson's disease is going to show up. So I just want you to see that there is a relationship uh, between those, and especially multiple system atrophy and Parkinson's disease. But we can rule this out just because uh, it's neurological, and it's not. We're not talking about uh, neurological uh, symptoms. Then the next one is autoimmune autonomic neuropathy, um, and uh, again, it says it's similar to what's above, which we haven't gotten to yet. But then it also says that there will be additional findings of sensory abnormalities, pain, and loss of deep tendon reflexes. So how can we rule that out? Say that again? 
And what kind of symptoms are those? But what kind of symptom, symptoms are those? Yeah, they're more neurological findings. So we can rule this out for the same reason we can rule out the other ones. Different symptoms, but still his lack of neurological symptoms uh, conveniently rules both of those out. Okay. Um, so then we move up here, and we're looking at pure autonomic failure. Okay. So there's orthostatic hypotension, which our guy has. But then there's gastroparesis, which our guy doesn't have. And then there's uh, urinary retention problems, which our guy doesn't have. And then there's decreased sweating, which our guy definitely does have. Um, and then ophthalmo ophthalmological <laughs> manifestations. It's really hard to say these words at the end of the day. Um, basically means weird stuff with his eyes, which our guy doesn't have. Um, and then failure of either erection or ejaculation, which our guy doesn't have. So we have a couple of things here that goes with our guy, um, but there's a lot more to it. Now, because I'm working from the bottom up, this is actually not a complete, completely useful list of information. If we move up from here, now we see sort of those same things that were just listed there, but they're broken into two different lists. Okay. Uh, why? What are these two different lists? Nope. Um, let me try it. It might not come out right. What's the difference between these two lists? What does that mean? Right. So in the autonomic nervous system, there are two divisions, the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. Um, so which list fits with our guy better? The sympathetic one, okay. which is to say, uh, well, he has orthostatic hypertension and decreased sweating. Um, he doesn't have ejaculatory dysfunction. I'll explain why in a little bit. And he doesn't have uh, toast associated with Horner syndrome, which I'll explain in a little bit. But he fits with this list fairly well. He definitely does not fit with this list, okay, which is to say that the problems he's having are specifically sympathetic. Okay, now. Um, I actually used to have a slightly different version of this case, which in fact did include ejaculatory dysfunction. Um, it was, the case started off saying that he went to the doctor to ask about Viagra. Okay. Um, and I changed that for two reasons. One of which is Viagra commercials have changed. So, uh, I used to do it because Viagra commercials used to be, you know, uh, footed tubs on the beach with, you know, a woman. Very vague about what Viagra is actually for. And so the point I was kind of making in the, in the case was uh, just because you see something on the television describing a drug doesn't mean that you need the drug. Okay. But it at least suggested that there was something about uh, reproductive function there. So that's why he went in to ask about it. I also was putting it in there because. Um, like the semester before I started using this case, a friend of our, uh, friend of my wife and I, um, had problems down there and wouldn't go to the doctor because he was, um, uh, he just doesn't like doctors. And it wasn't until it got to be just horrible, um, not in quite the graphic way that that might suggest, but he really was motivated to go into the doctor. And it was because of where the problem was. And knowing this guy that he might very well have, if it was something else, said, I can live with it, whatever. So I put the Viagra thing in there that that's what got the guy into the office because sometimes with, with men, that's the only thing that's gonna drive them in there. Um, <clears throat> so I took that out for a couple of reasons. One, the, the Viagra commercials have now been much more explicit about what they really do. Um, and so if you don't understand what Viagra is for, uh, you're not paying attention. I mean, what it was is he went in looking for it, and the first question the doctor asked is, do you have a problem with an erection? He says, oh, no, not at all. And, so, and that's what Viagra is for. Uh, but that does 
did tell the doctor in the story that I made that uh, it was an ejaculatory problem that I was having. So, um, but anatomically, for my case, uh, ejaculation doesn't quite fit, so I took it out. Now, the reason why ptosis isn't in the case, even though it kind of fits with this, um, actually, the anatomical explanation doesn't fit. It's more because weird looking eyes just freak me out so i didn't want to have it in the case so i read the case i get to do what i want so he doesn't have it okay it's just these two but he falls into the sympathetic version of um where'd it go oh well down here uh pure autonomic failure okay so um i have walked you through finding the uh uh diagnosis for this um, and I'll explain why when I wrap all this up, why I've done it this way. But uh, that gets us to pure autonomic failure. So you can do a search for this, um, and this is that search that I was a little surprised that I didn't see a second ago. Um, if you're not using the Chrome browser, I don't know if your browser works like this, but in Chrome, since it's Google's browser, if you highlight text and they'll right click on it, you automatically get a link to do a Google search on that highlighted text. So that's just a quick way to do this. And so um, in doing this, uh, obviously the first thing here is a Wikipedia page, but after the Wikipedia page, which is just you know where everybody goes for information from Google, so it's almost always at the top. The next one here is uh, from Vanderbilt University. Um, and this is a page from the Autonomic Dysfunction Center, the Vanderbilt School of Medicine has a group that specializes in the autonomic system. And this is a page that describes this pure autonomic failure. Um, I want to um, concentrate on the section here that talks about pathology, because um, that'll help us understand what's happening here. Now, I've always felt that this particular article is written weird. Um, and I'll, I'll show you why in a sec. Um, and I, I just can't understand why they wrote it this way, but they did. Um, so there's two paragraphs here about pathology. They don't ever get around to actually talking about the pathology of pure autonomic failure until the second half of the second um, paragraph here. They start off by, well, they do start off by saying something directly about uh, pure autonomic failure, which is it's not been completely elucidated, which is another way of saying idiopathic, or we don't actually know what causes it. Um, but it is known to be a loss of cells in the intramedialateral column of the spinal cord. Now, I'm an anatomist, and I can't exactly tell you what they're talking about here. Actually, that's not true. You know exactly what they're talking about here, but the anatomical terms that they use here are very inaccurate or vague or whatever you want to say. Okay. Um, so medio means middle and lateral means side. Whoops, side. Okay. And so intermediolateral means between the middle and the side, which in anatomical means you got midline, and you got the edge of, in this case, the spinal cord. So intermediolateral is going to be sort of the halfway point between them. Okay, if you can kind of picture that. <clears throat> Actually, you don't have to, try to picture that. Uh, um, okay, so you have a spinal cord here okay, with the gray matter. So you've got midline right here, and then this is the side. And so halfway between intermedial lateral would be right there. Okay. See where I'm showing? Okay. What they're taught, oh, and then what does it say? Intermedial lateral column of the spinal cord. Now, column, especially from a very anatomical point of view, when you're talking about the brain, the spinal cord, really means the white matter. This is the dorsal column. This is the lateral column. This is the anterior column. Okay. Um, when you're talking about gray matter, you're talking about horns. This is the ventral horn. This is the 
uh, dorsal horn, this is the lateral horn here. Okay? But for where that line, the intermediate lateral line is, it falls over right here where the lateral horn is. And that's what they really mean. So somebody who is using actually very old-fashioned anatomical terms is calling this the intermediate lateral column. But really, the more modern term for it and the term that we use when we're learning about it in um, this anatomy class is it's, oops, sorry, that column, um, the lateral horn. That's the gray matter that we associate with the autonomic nervous system. Um, so what they're saying is that uh, there's a known loss of cells in that particular region of the gray matter. Okay. Um, and then the rest of what it says in that sentence, don't worry about because uh, I don't really want to get caught up in the chemical things going on in the system, but it does talk about a little bit more there. But I just want you to... Uh, um, concentrate on that statement right there, and I uh, decoded the uh, anatomical definition there. It's just the lateral column, the lateral horn. Yeah. And after saying that, it then goes on to say that autonomic failure should be dis distinguished from two other things, which are multiple system atrophy, or MSA, and Parkinson's disease, or <laughs> idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is a little bit redundant. Parkinson's disease is idiopathic. Um, and then the first half of the next sentence is really more about what you find in MSA and Parkinson's disease. And then it gets into uh, periodontal failure. There's two sentences here, and why I personally, I would have put the second one first, but or actually I would have never written the first one. Um, that kind of talk about the same thing. This is the one that's about MSA and Parkinson's, and then this is the one that's about um, periodontic failure. But in both sentences, they're referring to what's called alpha synuclein. Okay. Um, the alpha uh, on this is just distinguishing this particular thing from a couple of others that are referred to as beta synuclein and Actually, I'm not positive that there is such a thing, but there may be a gamma synuclein. Okay. Um, so the, the Greek letter designates is just when there's multiple forms of something. The synuclein part of this is referring to a protein. Okay. Now, um, when a protein is the toxic molecule causing the death of cells, which is essentially what they're saying here, um, it's not going to be a protein that you've ingested. Could be a protein that comes from a pathogen, but we know that this is not caused by a pathogen. How do we know this is not caused by a pathogen? Yeah, he, again, there's no signs of infection. He's not going to have a fever. Okay. So if there's a toxic mo a protein in your body, you can't have ingested it because it would have been digested and it wouldn't be toxic, uh, or your liver would have gotten rid of it. Um, or it could have gotten there by a pathogen, but we know that's not the case in this particular situation because he doesn't have an infection. So that means it's a protein that his body makes normally. Okay. Um, and what's happened is it's become toxic. So alpha synuclein is called alpha because it's the first one that is described. As is usually the case with things like this, the first thing that gets described is the one that is related to a disease. Beta synuclein, I think it's beta synuclein, um, is the normal version of this protein. Okay? So everybody has a gene for synuclein in their uh, DNA, presumably. Um, and you make it in your cells, and in these particular cells here, you make these. Actually, it's, I think, a fairly common neuronal um, protein. And it folds up into some three-dimensional shape, like any protein would. The beta synuclein version is the, the correctly folded version of the protein. Okay. And then alpha synuclein is where something weird happens and the protein is no longer shaped the way it is. 
Now, um, to demonstrate protein folding, I usually use these bendy things here. So, proteins are chains of amino acids, so this is an amino acid. And let's say that um, famous nucleon looks like that, okay. funky pretzel. Um, and in this shape, it does something. I actually have no idea what synuclein does, but it has some feature. Maybe it binds to DNA. Maybe it uh, activates an enzyme. Uh, maybe it uh, holds on to calcium ions. I don't know what it actually does, but uh, it has some function. But we don't know why. It's an idiopathic disease. Something happens that changes the beta synuclein version of the protein, so it folds wrong. Whether that happens so that when synuclein is made, it misfolds, or if previously correctly folded protein unfolds, or something like that, I have no idea. And nobody probably knows. Um, but alpha synuclein is just a um, wrongly folded version of the protein. And I had a better word on the tip of my tongue than wrongly folded, but a bad protein. What exactly causes that, we don't know. But um, it says here alpha synuclein accumulation in cytoplasmic inclusions, yada, yada, yada. What that's saying is looking at the cells that are um, uh, lost or that are dying off, we find that their cytoplasm has a lot of this alpha synuclein in it, which is the evidence that it's a toxic molecule. Okay. Um, and it's it's something about that protein supposed to do some normal function, and it misfolds and it loses its function, causes the death of the cell. Okay. Um, proteins are actually fairly sensitive to those kinds of changes. Um, Alzheimer's disease is caused by a different protein, but the same kind of misfolding of protein. Um, Parkinson's disease is caused by this particular misfolding of protein. Huntington's disease um, is another protein mishap thing. That's actually a genetic disease, so there's a mutation in that protein. So it's common in uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases for that kind of thing to happen. But, um, but that's what's happening here. Now, we don't know why it's happening, it's idiopathic, but something's causing this to happen and it's killing cells. Um, for our guy, the cells that are being killed are specifically the ones that are in charge of sympathetic functions. Um, okay, let me just... Uh, Jump to this picture real quick. Um, so the uh, sympathetic system is based upon the output from the thoracic and upper lumbar spinal cord. Okay, um, and so the dots that we see here are supposed to represent those neurons in the lateral horn. Okay, so if these guys are dying off, there will no longer be a presynaptic fiber going out to the chain ganglia, and therefore the ganglion will not get any input knowing what information to send on to uh, the heart or um, oh, blood vessels, there they are, uh, or um, sweat glands, which are actually on this side of the picture. So those things are not getting the input that they're supposed to because the presynaptic neurons are dying off in this, okay? Um, now, I actually kind of uh, glossed over this, but uh, I said, I pointed out the cytoplasmic inclusions. In here, it goes on to say brainstem nuclei, um, which does not apply to our guy, uh, because if it were brainstem nuclei that were affected, which division would be involved? which division of the autonomic system, right, that's the craniosacral, so that would have brain stem nuclei. Um, and then it just says pre and post ganglionic sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, um, which is to say that 
sort of includes the preganglionic uh, sympathetic gang, uh, neurons. Personally, if I were writing that phrase, which is not grammatically the best phrase in the world anyways, um, I'd say pre or post ganglionic, sympathetic or parasympathetic, um, which is to point out that there are different versions of the disease, but they're just trying to be all inclusive. So this is, you know, the kinds of things that are affected by either the sympathetic or the parasympathetic variations of this disease. And it's inclusive for all the different kinds of um, symptoms that you might see. But where'd it go? Uh, the symptoms for this case in particular um, actually point to the problems being more in the upper thoracic region. Okay, And this is the other reason why I took the uh, ejaculatory dysfunction out. Because the ejaculatory dysfunction is to be coming out of the, probably the upper lumbar region, going through the inferior, mes uh, yeah, inferior mesenteric, and then going to the external genitalia down here. Um, so anatomically, based on what I've written in this case, it doesn't make sense for these cells and these cells way down here to be affected. He really should have all of the cells affected, which would mean he'd have a lot more sympathetic symptoms. And to keep this, the case simple, I kept the number of symptoms low. Uh, so I took that ejaculatory thing out because it just didn't fit with the way that I'd written the rest of the case. But, and that's my prerogative because uh, as far as the, our patient's concerned, I'm God. So, yeah. um, but, so that's really why those particular symptoms are uh, presented. And um, there are other things. Um, wait, where was I going? I don't know where I was going with that. But... Um, also, the, the eye thing that I left out um, is not entirely fair, but I can kind of argue my way around uh, out of it. Uh, the eye would be conf probably controlled mostly by T1, maybe T2 level neurons, um, which would then project up all the way here. And this is just showing you the pupillary constriction stuff, but it will have effects on other aspects of the eye too. Um, and so mine is kind of more really centered into this area. Um, now, s they have this little chunk of skin here to represent sweat glands and other things um, that are under control. To make this a simplistic picture, they have it drawn coming out just from right there. But really, you have skin all over your body. So uh, the whatever level the signals coming out from it's probably going to be controlling that local area of skin and so if he's having problems with uh, cardiovascular stuff um, the sweat glands that are controlled by this area too are going to be a lot of the ones in the chest and armpit area which are the ones you'd expect to see sweating if you're exerting yourself for um, basketball so i'm just trying to explain uh, away the fact that I don't have gross eye pictures in this. So, I don't have any pictures. But, uh, so it really is, I, the, the case comes to be rather anatomically uh, defined as being right in that area. So other, we don't see all sorts of other things because they don't fit into the way that I wrote the case. And so it's really just in that area right there. So, um, Let's see, was there something else I can see? No, I think that, that sums things up pretty well. Any questions about the case or this? Uh, um, yeah, the disease you want us to go this in depth? To, to solve the cases as we work through them? I actually am going to address that question in a second, but I just want to see before we get away from the case itself, anything in that anybody needs to sort of explain a little bit more? Okay, so yeah, that's kind of where I want to go next, what I want to think about next. Um, 
it's a little ways off, but you will be um, going to look at these other cases uh, in preparation for the um, practical exam. Um, this one that we've done here, obviously, is about the autonomic system. Um, and I said earlier that the next one is about the endocrine system, which, of course, is over the next week. And then three and four are about the cardiovascular system. Um, I actually have no idea why I did this, but four is about the blood, which we do before the heart, which is what five is about, uh, three is about. So for some strange reason, when I was laying all this out, I put the blood case after the heart case, even though we actually do blood before we get to the heart. No real reason for that. Um, there's not a specific case about the sensory systems, um, and there's not a specific case about blood vessels. Okay. Um, now, there, the reason for that with the sensory systems, partly it's because um, I really kind of consider sensory systems as the last part of AMP1. And so when we get into AMP2, we really are starting with the autonomous system. Um, so it's not highlighted here because personally, I don't think it's as important a part of this course as this other stuff. Now, that's not to say that I don't think it's an important part of this course, just that um, I didn't focus on just that. But you will actually notice that it comes up in um, some of these cases in how it's related to some of the symptoms that are described there. So, um, and uh, you can s hopefully kind of pay attention to that when you're looking at these in more de detail. Now, uh, case three tells you right off, it says presentation, a 39-year-old type 1 diabetic patient, yada, yada, yada. So it tells you right off the bat, it's diabetes, okay? Uh, case three, um, it's not on, oh. Yeah, I think it's at, on the next page. Um, it says that he has congestive heart failure. Okay. Um, so these two explicitly say what the diagnosis is, so you don't need to go to that level. And then number four doesn't expressly say he has such and such disease, but it's about a university professor that goes on a um, field trip doesn't sound right, but uh, it goes to do research in South America um, or something like that. And it tells you what he didn't do in preparation for that trip, which will make it very obvious what happened. So it doesn't expressly say the diagnosis, but it's pretty clear from what he has. Um, so the other three, the, it already lays out that stuff. With this one, knowing that we're talking about it in class, um, I didn't put the diagnosis in there because I wanted to show you kind of how to go through that. Um, you're not going to need to go through these at that level. This is really the hardest case that we have here, but I wanted to use it to walk through this idea of using differential diagnosis as a problem solving tool. And also, if, if I gave you this and I said, okay, I want you to come in next week and tell me what's going on with this case, I wouldn't expect any of you to be able to do the same thing on your own. It was really that I was directing the whole thing, so I knew where we were going and I knew how to set up the next thing in that. So don't worry, you're not going to be expected to do that kind of uh, analysis of any of these cases. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and like I said, I'm not quite sure when, which week it'll be, but either the week that we do the blood or the week that we do the heart. Um, I'll talk more about the practical exam, which will give, so that'll be at least two weeks before the exam. So it'll give everybody uh, plenty of information before, so they, they can start preparing for it. Although you should start preparing for it right away, you should just, you know, with the material we do from week to week, you need to study and be sure that you understand what all is going on there, which hopefully is part of the process of you doing the, uh, the assignments that you have. But, um, I'll show you a little bit more di directly what you need to concentrate on to prepare for the practical and get closer to it. So. Um, <clears throat> Okay, now I realized earlier, either earlier in this class or in the previous class, 
that I forgot last week to talk about safety orientation, right? I didn't talk about any of that. Okay. Um, I would normally do this in the lab room. I'm certainly not going to say, okay, everybody get up and let's walk across the hall because that's just not worth our time. So I'm going to talk about it in here. Um, I'm not going to be able to show you everything because we're obviously not in the lab room, but I do want to be sure that I uh, address a few things. Um, and really the stuff in the lab that we need to be aware of safety-wise uh, when we are actually in the lab doing actual lab stuff, I have to point that out to you that day anyways to be sure everybody still knows what's going on. But um, I do want to say a few things um, just so everybody's familiar with some uh, safety issues. Uh, first off is on this phone you can see here there's a little wall mounted sign that says it. Um, for emergency, dial 3911, okay? Um, what that is, is it's a phone number directly to the campus police, which is actually 413-755-3911. But if you use one of these black plastic phones that are connected to the wall, um, since that's in the system, you don't have to uh, um, dial the whole number, just the extension 3911. So it's sort of like calling 911, except that you're calling to the campus police. And they are, uh, or we have in our campus police emergency responders, like 911 operators would sound here. But they're much closer. So if we need somebody, they'll get here a lot quicker than a 911 operator can get, get somebody here. Also, they know where to go. Okay? If you were to call 911 from your cell phone or something like that, and you said, I'm on the state campus and I need some help and I'm in building two. They would know really where to go. Okay. If you haven't noticed, the numbering system for the, the buildings here on campus isn't the most logical. We're in building two, next door is building 13, and 17, and 27, and 27. Um, so uh, the on campus responders are going to know where to go best. If we do need somebody to come, if you call 3911 and you really need an ambulance, they'll coordinate with the 911 operator to get somebody here. Um, actually, since they're a police department, they have a, a more direct connection to that. Um, and so if somebody come over here, assess the situation, and they'll just radio over to the operator of campus um, to uh, get somebody from 911. And when somebody comes, uh, the front gate, which is, of course, run by our campus police, will know exactly where to send everybody. They can even go so far as to uh, you know, block traffic from going down the road right here in front of the, room, the building so that the ambulance can drive up the wrong way on the road to get to us, rather than having to drive all the way around campus. It's just better to call 3911. Now, I mention that because I've actually had to use that a few times. Um, and I just, so I'm not just saying it because it's something that, it, but it is something that has come up a few times. Um, if you're going to use the in-system in phones, 3911, you're going to use your cell phone anywhere on campus, and you need to call for emergency response, use the whole 10 digit number, pull into the Um Also, uh, I want to talk a little bit about evacuation procedures, I guess you'd say. Um, to, Usually I do this in the lab, and the lab actually has uh, a red fire alarm thing in the ceiling. It's not in here, it's probably next door or something like that. But you'll know when it goes off just the same. Um, so it's a klaxon that makes you know, the, the alarm sound, and a voice will come on saying something to the effect of, uh, an emergency has been reported in your area, please evacuate the building, or whatever I'm saying. Um, and this is true basically all over campus that you need to figure out how to evacuate the building. For this room, it tells you right here what to do, which is to go down this hallway and uh, exit through the stairwell at the end. Um, what it doesn't say exactly, um, oh, no, it does say this here. The one across the hall doesn't say quite as clearly. This is assemble as a group away from the building. Um, I always state this explicitly because apparently people don't understand what should be a fairly common sense thing, which is if you're evacuating a building that might be on fire, you should not stand right next to that building. 
Um, if when we evacuate this building, which hopefully will not happen because it's a little disruptive, but whatever does happen, notice that there's a bunch of people that walk out the front door and stop. And I wouldn't be surprised if some people lean against the building to, to rest and fall down. You should get away from the building if it's potentially on fire. Now, it's not likely that this building is going to go up in a flaming inferno or anything like that, but uh, you need to be careful. Several years ago, up on the seventh floor, there was a fire in one of the telecommunications or teleproduction department rooms, which was pretty much contained within the, the room, except that there was an aerosol can in there that when the fire heated that up, it exploded. And it blew the window out on the side of the building there. So if anybody had been standing right next to the building right there, they would have had glass shower down. Fortunately, nobody was. Um, but yeah, just generally move away from the building. Um, if we're in the lab room when that happens, 510, which is the lab room that we're using, um, I think from that room, it's actually been a little while since I looked at the pocket, but I think from that room, we go down the central uh, stairwell and leave. Um, and if we do go down the central stairwell, uh, again, remember to go through the doors and keep going, get away from the building. Um, and probably it wouldn't happen, but if it's a fire and the fire uh, responders have gotten here quickly, they're trying to get into the building, that's the way they get in. So if we're evacuating down those stairs, they're trying to get in through those stairs, please move over so they can rescue people. Um, <clears throat> above the door here, this placard has some rules which I want to uh, say something about. Um, and there's a sign like this in all of the rooms in our department. It says no smoking, which is a state law. It's against state law to smoke in uh, any state buildings, um, which means not just this room, but anywhere in the building, of course. Um, Several years ago, apparently, uh, somebody didn't quite understand that nuance of the no smoking policy, and so somebody was smoking in the boys' room, um, who obviously was a boy, um, and he threw his cigarette butt into the trash, and it caught on fire, and we had to evacuate. And so, yeah, boys are stupid. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no smoking in the building. And in fact, the state law includes no smoking within 25 feet of a building. Uh, I mean, within 25 feet of a an entrance. So if you are the sort of person that smokes, uh, please notice that there are lines painted on the ground around all the doors to the buildings on campus. They're supposed to be blue, but they're fading. Um, and that's meant to be an indication of how far away you need to stand. So if you see the line, please step back. And if you see other smokers that are standing within the line, it would be nice if you would remind them they're supposed to stand back too. Um, those sorts of policies only work if, if somebody uh, pays attention to them. So please, uh, if you're going to kill yourself, please do it kindly 25 feet away from the doors. Um, and being a and 2 I will be explaining to you why you should not be smoking in general. Um, so we do that. But uh, <clears throat> no eating and drinking is getting at the fact that this is a science department and there's potentially uh, hazardous things, pathogenic things around you. Um, you're sitting at a table that somebody earlier might have been sitting at after taking microbiology upstairs and they didn't quite wash their hands that well. Um, so the easiest way to get pathogens into your system is through oral presentation. So if you're touching the, the desktop where you are and then you have a bag of chips or something like that and you put those in your mouth, then you're just going to introduce things into your system. So eating's not allowed. Um, drinking I actually don't enforce quite that way because you might have noticed that I'm always drinking a little something while I'm lecturing. Now I do that for two reasons. One, um, I talk a lot and I need to uh, hydrate so I don't start coughing. Um, and also because I have some cardiovascular issues and I need to keep my blood volume up. So the more water I have on board, the more plasma I have. That helps things out. Um, so I'm always drinking, and I'm not going to say, well, I'm the professor, I can do whatever I want, but you're the student, so you have to follow the rules. So I interpret that rule in such a way that it'll allow everybody um, to drink if they need to. Um, all it is, all what I'm going to enforce is that if you're going to drink, it has to be in a covered container. So I have my travel mug there. Sometimes I'll have 
Um, I have a little popped up uh, water bottle that I use, uh, which I think I had last week. Um, oh, I threw it away, but during my afternoon lab, I had a screw top you know, water bottle um, from the meeting I had this at lunch. Um, and you know, there's a number of things out here. I don't see anything that, that doesn't pass muster for me. Um, I had a student uh, several years ago that drove me crazy um, because he went to Dunkin', not Starbucks, but he got something like this, set it down on the desk in front of him, took the plastic lid off, and drank out of the open cup. Please, if you get something with a lid, leave the lid on it. Uh, it just limits how much it's spilled. Um, those pathogens I suggested might be here. Um, would love for you to share whatever sugary drink you might have with you. Okay. So what I do enforce is no open containers and no pop top cans like, you know, Red Bull or something like that. Uh, well, any pop top can it doesn't have to be Red Bull, but you know, soda or whatever it is. Definitely no beer, uh, but uh, nothing that can easily spill. Now the covered container thing isn't perfect to keep from spilling, but it does limit it somewhat. And especially if it's something that has a closure on it, then you know, open it up to take a drink and close it when you put it down. Um, so, which is to say you're welcome to uh, have a drink. You might need some uh, sugar or caffeine on board to make it through the night. That's fine. Uh, just keep in mind that. If for some reason I have to have somebody fill in for me if something happens and I can't be here, which I don't anticipate because if something like that were to come up, I would just cancel class and put stuff online for you to do. But if for some reason, like at 5.20 something happens and it's too late for me to cancel class because you're already here, I might ask, ask one of my colleagues to stand in or something like that. If for some weird reason there is somebody else up here for me <coughs> and they interpret that a little bit differently about the drinking, um, please respect what they have to say. I have some colleagues who will allow you to drink water, but nothing else. I certainly don't want to have to go around and check what everybody's drinking. Um, or have to police that everybody has an, a transparent bottle that we can see that it's uh, water. Or, which of course, it could be vodka for all we know. <laughs> um, and uh, some people will just say across the board, no drinking at all. So if somebody else happens to be running the class one night, which I think is going to be a very unlikely situation, please do respect what they have to say. I have to say that because one summer that did happen, I uh, had to have somebody cover a class. And that was just because in the summer, uh, if you miss one class, it's like missing a week. Um, well, it's one class for you guys anyways. but. Um, for, it'd be like missing a whole week of a regular semester. Um, <clears throat> and so I had somebody come in and cover the class for me, and one of my students had her uh, Duncan iced coffee thing that she just bought. And my colleague who was covering for me very nicely said, you can't drink that in here. And my student just said, well, Dr. Poe would let me drink that, and got all huffy and might have even said something kind of rude to her. Um, which surprised the hell out of me because this was just, you know, the, the, the sweetest, I just couldn't imagine that she would have that kind of attitude with dinner. But apparently it was early in the morning, she hadn't, hadn't actually drank any coffee yet, so she was a little bit um, upset about the idea. But please, if somebody else is up here, uh, respect what they have to say. Um, there are a couple of other things about the lab specifically, uh, which I will mention when we're in lab. But those are the main things I wanted to address, especially the eating and drinking thing. Um, and for eating, it's not just don't eat during class time, don't eat in here. If you're going to eat before class or during the break or whatever, um, take it out into the hallway and I would strongly suggest before you put your hand on any food that's going to go into your mouth, use a little hand sanitizer that's next to the um, elevators too. So. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I'll have a few other things to say when we're in the lab, but that's the main big things to talk about. Um, any questions anybody has? Not necessarily just about safety, but just in general. Anything? All right, so if you don't have any questions, that's it for tonight. And uh, remember what I said about the uh, sensory systems part four. If you've already done it and you'd like 
like me to reset it for you for the new version. Uh, just save your work and let me know so you can put the things in. If you haven't submitted it but you want to get a second chance at that question that I reformatted, same thing applies to you. Let me know. I'll erase what you've done so far and you can get another shot. And if you've not done it, it doesn't matter because you're going to see the new version of it. Otherwise, have a nice night. Uh, right. Okay. I mean, I do, uh, essentially, yes.